from the Forbidden Blend. But I told him, you can charge me whatever you want, but keep that duck on a leash. The man's punchline was met with raucous laughter. Well, fellas, that'll do me. He set down his club soda and lime. Ten minutes and countless handshakes later, the man with the thin hat made his way out of the crowded bar. It was chilly outside. The steam from the grates in the sidewalk formed opaque walls of mist as he stepped through them. He walked down a side street. There was his Cadillac, white as a ghost, wide as a whale. He pulled at the handle and the driver's side door opened wide. He never bothered locking his car, no matter where he went. Turning the key in the ignition, he pulled out of the alleyway, turned onto the main drag, and started his journey. After hours on the road, he pulled off the highway. He passed through miles of wheat fields and horizon lines. Eventually, he pulled up to a lone farmhouse. Killing the engine, he grabbed his suitcase, adjusted his bow tie, and exiting the car, walked up to the front door. He rapped on the glass pane three times in quick succession. A tired-looking woman answered the door. Yes? Can I help you? A thick layer of Midwestern politeness slathered over genuine irritation. The man smiled broadly. Can I interest you in eternal salvation, miss? The woman was taken aback by the question. Oh, I'm sorry, I go to services at First Presbyterian over on Mapleton. So, the man continued as if unimpeded. That's just fine. I myself am not associated with any religious organization or church. Catholics a little too strict, Unitarians a little too lax, if you catch my drift. He removed his hat. The chilly wind played games with the thin tufts of hair on his head. The woman's social conditioning kicked in. Would you like to come in? The man smiled. Well, yes, I would. Thank you kindly, miss. She motioned for them to enter, the man, his hat, and his suitcase. He sat down on her ancient but comfortable couch. She perched opposite him on a rigid oak chair. They sat across from each other in silence for a time. His eyes lazily scanned the room. Small porcelain angels in the cupboards, a cross stitch that read 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 5 hung on the wall. Pictures of Jesus were strategically placed throughout. The man picked up his briefcase from his side and laid it on the smooth coffee table between them. He flicked the clasps. I'd like to extend an invitation to you. Ten minutes later, the man closed the door behind him, made his way to the street, opened the driver's side door of his car, slid into the seat, and drove off, wheat fields growing distant in his rear view. Days later, several bundles of newspapers had piled up on the doorstep of the farmhouse, untouched. What, what, what do you want? Do you have any idea what time it is? The large, powerfully built man sputtered from behind the creaky screen door. The brisk sea wind nearly blew off the late night visitor's thin hat. I understand the hour is quite late, sir, but no hour is too late for matters of eternity. The large man leaned against the door frame and stared, the gold chain crucifix around his neck glinting in the doorway light. Are you for real? The man with the thin hat smiled. Quite real, sir. Quiet. I didn't think the Mormons came as far east. No sail, pal. The thin man took a small step forward, his face fully illuminated in the front porch light. I'm no friend of Mr. Joseph Smith, but I do have something worth a little more than gold plates from under the ground. 
if you give me a moment of your time. The large man sighed, resistance beaten back. It's cold out there. You better come on in. The thin man strode casually past the large man into the small apartment. Shutting the door behind him, the large man pulled out his cell phone, the scruffy face of Padre Pio staring out from the home screen, and checked the time. Then he crossed himself as a matter of habit and meandered into the tiny living room. Fifteen minutes later, the thin man quietly exited the front door, took a long look at the moon shining over the ocean to his right, and made his way down the steep stone steps to his car. The sound of an engine turning over was slightly overpowered by the waves crashing. Within seconds, the man and his car were gone. The next morning, the cell phone on the ground buzzed and buzzed, Padre Pio staring out in the direction of the ceiling. It went to voicemail. Jimmy, where are you? You were supposed to be here by five. I text, I call, I drop by the house and you don't answer. Don't show up tomorrow. You do and you're a dead man. The hot sun beat down on the tiny apartment. Raising his sweaty hand to his line of sight, the weather app on the man's cell read 99 degrees, 80% humidity. He sat in his sparse apartment. Deep indentations and the sections of light discolored carpet were the only remnants of furniture sold or pawned to cover one more month of L.A. rent. A weathered copy of An Actor Prepares peeked out from under the beanbag chair the man sat in. Expelling a deep sigh, the man rose, used the wood-paneled wall to stretch, and went to the window. The one selling point of the apartment, the large windows that lined the front, were naked now, blinds and curtains sold for petty cash months before. He stared out, seeing the cars pass by in an almost panoramic view. No calls from his agent today. No calls from his agent last week. She may have dropped him for all he knew. He hadn't gone on an audition for almost six months, hadn't booked a gig in almost a year. It was the dead season for his restaurant job. All his cards were maxed out. He honestly didn't know how he was going to get through the month. He opened the front door and walked out into the blazing heat. The grass felt dry and prickly under his bare feet. He looked across the street to see the neighborhood lawns in much the same condition. How did it come to this? He would ask himself several times a day. More so when he had time to think. Those were the worst. Being alone with his thoughts. He was never much of a drinker, but God, he could see the appeal. Drinking himself into oblivion. Something to stop his mind from racing. Something to stop him from focusing on the proverbial shadows and not the light itself. He'd been trying to make the acting thing work for so many years, he was afraid he didn't know how to do anything else. Be anything else. But he kept going. His circle of acting friends grew smaller as the years ticked by. I'm doing real estate now. My temp job wants to bring me on full time. With benefits. I've got a kid now. Gotta be more realistic. Each soldier that fell out of rank added to his mounting fear. Was he being stupid? Still, out of habit or something else he didn't really understand, he kept going. One foot after the other. Day in. Day out. You on TV yet, act the boy? His navel-gazing was derailed by the piercing voice of his 78-year-old Brooklyn transplant neighbor, forever followed by her strangely silent parakeet which hung around her constantly like a tiny, colorful vulture. Not yet, Mr. Osman. 
You still trying? Yes, Miss Strassman. Good. Don't get naked lest they pay you double. I won't, Miss Strassman. His only human interaction of the day concluded. He bid Miss Strassman and her bird, he thought its name was Stanley, goodbye. Stepping back inside, he rooted around for a clean shirt and started to get ready for the dinner shift. Hours later, sweaty, exhausted, and starving, he pulled into his driveway. Through a heavy combination of pills and Botox, most of his clientele were impossible to gauge mood-wise. Every night was a roll of the dice when it comes to tips, and he was used to them coming up snake eyes more often than not. He'd fought back temptation all the way home, in an out burger beckoning like a lighthouse. You have meals prepped at home, he would tell himself. Dry, old chicken, stale rice, and wilted broccoli. But it was bought and paid for. Just had to power through. He locked the front door behind him and dropped his bag. Peeling off his disgusting work shirt, then his even more disgusting undershirt, he walked into his kitchen. Absent-mindedly scratching his bare chest, he grabbed some filters from a high cupboard and started to prep some coffee. It was late, and he was so tired. But he needed to keep those artistic engines running or they'd get rusty. Then he'd have nothing to blame for not booking gigs but himself. No sooner had he placed the pot under the drip, pressed the button, and went over to grab a book of monologues, he heard a knock at the door. Several, in fact. What the hell? He thought. He walked over to the front door. No use trying to pretend he wasn't home. The front hall light was on, clear as day. He peeked through the spy hole in the door. There, presented in weird, warped angles, standing on his front step, was a man on the small side. He had a plain face, slightly pale. On his neck was a pristine bow tie, and on his head sat a strangely thin hat. By his side was a sturdy-looking briefcase with shiny gold clasps. Too tired to care about safety, the bare-chested man unlocked the door and swung it open. Yes? The bare-chested man asked, much louder than necessary, hoping to scare the other man off. The attempt failed. How do you do, sir? How are we this fine evening? Well, to be honest, bud, tired. What are you here for? To the point. I appreciate brevity if employed to a mutually beneficial end. I'm here regarding eternity and all that the hereafter entails. Ah, oh, Christ. They got you guys out here this late? Don't they let you sleep? Well... The bare-chested man looked at the slight missionary in his fancy outfit, then out at the brutal, unforgiving L.A. night. I just put coffee on. Come on in. You can run your spiel past me and I'll give you notes. He extended an arm, welcoming the man with the thin hat to enter. 